so welcome to the pop culture classrooms twitch channel my name is dion harris uh otherwise known as the shoe thief online or on twitch in particular um some of you may know me from the adobe channel as well but i am going to be showing you guys a few tips and tricks uh to using photoshop um now because Photoshop is pretty much the industry standard for um, photo editing um, and some digital painting, I'm also going to be showing you guys a few alternatives to Photoshop as well. Um, a couple of the alternatives are uh, Clip Studio Paint, which is uh, also very similar to Photoshop and actually all of these different programs that I have listed here are going to be uh, fairly similar to Photoshop. So a lot of the tricks that I'm going to be showing you guys today also um, apply to these other programs as well. Uh, Clip Studio Paint is another good program. Um, it's mainly used uh, for illustrators that are illustrating comic books because it has a really good pen tool. Um, that pretty much simulates real uh, pen and ink very well. So if you're more of an illustrator or a comic book artist, then Clip Studio Paint is a very good cheap alternative that honestly goes on sale quite often. So you can often pick it up for a half price and it's usually around uh, 40 to 50 bucks. And it's not subscription either. So you pay for it once and you're done. Whereas Photoshop is about $20 a month. Um, especially if you're a teacher or a student, you can get it for 20 bucks a month and you get the full uh, creative suite. So that means Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, um, as well as their video editing software and um, their uh, animation software as well. Uh, Sketchbook Pro is another cheap alternative. I think it's usually about 10 to 15 bucks, um, but it's a really uh, slimmed down, um, easy to use program. Uh, Krita, oh, Krita as well is a uh, free alternative. So if you're looking for a free program to use, then Krita, uh, GIMP, and Paint Tool Sci are all free alternatives. So those are things that you can pick up for free and you know just kind of test out and you know get your legs up under you before you move on to a uh, a paid version. Or you could just you know stick with those your entire career. Um, I know some people, uh, fully professional artists, that still use Adobe Photoshop CS. And I believe you can get that for free on Adobe's uh, website as well. It's one of their really early versions of Photoshop. But I know professionals that are still using that to this day. So you don't necessarily have to have the most updated version of Photoshop to uh, still create content in it. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and jump into uh, the interface of Photoshop. So as you can see, uh, my interface is a bit darker than Photoshop usually starts out. And that was just a change that I made in the settings. Um, if you go to preferences and go to general, then this is where you can kind of set up, excuse me, your, um, your different Photoshop preferences. Uh, you have general, you have interface, and this is basically where you pick the uh, color of your theme. Now I went with a kind of darker gray just because I do a lot of illustration in Photoshop and this is a bit easier on the eyes for me. Um, but I believe Photoshop usually starts out this bright color like this and you can basically choose whichever version of that you like and again I went with a darker gray because it's easier on my eyes um, if you go to workspace 
this will basically show you the different panels and things that you could get visible or hidden while you're working. Um, we won't really get into that too much. Um, as far as tools, this basically shows you the different options you have for your tools as far as, you know, showing the tool tip while you're working. Um, enabling gestures, that's something that works with Windows Ink. Uh, we won't really be getting into that very much as well. Um, those are a bit more uh, advanced, so you don't really need those for um, um, your beginning. Uh, history log, this is basically um, how many steps Photoshop is saving in advance, so if you try to go uh, back to a previous step, then your history log is what's what your um, what Photoshop will be referencing for that uh, file handling. This is something that you don't really need to mess with that much. Um, about the only thing I'd say uh, do is enable auto recovery. Um, and auto recovery will basically save your butt um, a lot of times. Unfortunately, it is. Um, one of the uh, the newer um, add-ons for Photoshop so I don't believe that uh, CS Photoshop CS will have this option but it basically automatically saves your progress every well I have mine set to five minutes but you can set it to however many minutes you want but it'll automatically save so just in case Photoshop crashes on you or you have a power outage then this will make sure that you don't lose too much of your work. Um, and, you know, if you're working digitally for a living, that will really save you a lot of uh, pain and heartache <laughs> if you ever end up losing a project. Um, all right. Uh, as far as performance goes, you'll want to allocate at least 70% of your performance to Photoshop um, and that will you know have it run as optimally as possible um, if you have a really large computer system you could you know allocate more of that memory usage if, if you'd like um, but again that's up to you uh, here on the side it says history states 50 that basically means that if I if I'm drawing or something and I you know make a mistake and I go up here to edit undo then I can undo 50 times so that will also affect your uh, performance if you have like a lot of history states and you don't have a lot of um, available RAM then that can kind of slow things down so I pretty much have mine set up to 50 states two cache levels and that basically ensures that my Photoshop is running uh, fairly quickly. Uh, scratch discs, excuse me, scratch discs is basically um, where Photoshop is going to be writing uh, the information as you're uh, working. So on my pad, I only have one scratch disc, but on my uh, full desktop, I have a special scratch disc set aside that's specifically for Photoshop. So uh, one thing that Photoshop does is it works in layers. So these layers, if you could imagine, are just um, sheets of paper, of transparent paper that you lay on top of your background. So if I go down here to this bottom right hand corner, this little box with a plus sign in it, that's how you add a new layer. So I just click on that and it'll add a new layer here. Or you can go over here and just open this menu here and click on new layer and it'll do the same. You could go up here and just name your layer whatever. And that will be your layer name. So now I have two layers on top of this background layer here. So let's say I had, you know, something on this layer here. Okay. 
if I click this move tool, then I can use this to move around whatever I have on this specific layer. And that's what the move tool does. Uh, this tool here is called the uh, rectangular marquee or just the marquee tool. And you use this to select areas of your image that you'd like to edit. So everything inside of this rectangular area is basically what I'm editing. So I could either go in with a, a pen tool or something and draw in this area. And if I try to draw outside of the area, nothing will happen because I have it marqueed off. So it'll only edit what's within this area. But also, if you go back up here to the move tool, then you'll only move around what was selected in that area as well. I'll just step back here. Now the next tool is also a selection tool and we call this one the lasso tool because you're basically using it to lasso specific areas but it functions exactly the same as the uh, rectangular marquee tool so again everything within this little oval that I just drew is what I'll be editing so if I go back to my uh, brush tool then I can draw within that area but nothing outside of it and again you can go to the move tool and use that to move it around uh, next is the magic wand tool and this is used for making uh, pretty big selections so if I wanted to select all of the white space outside of this circle, I just click and it'll select everything outside of that circle. So now, if I went up to draw something, then it would only draw in that area that I have selected, the same as it did with the uh, marquee tool. Now let's say that you wanted to draw inside of the circle as well. All you have to do is go back up to your magic wand tool, hold down shift, click inside of that circle, and now you have the interior of the circle selected as well. So now everything I draw will look like it's not touching those brown lines that I just that I just drew earlier and also if these marching ants ever get kind of annoying or distracting for you you can just hit control H and it'll hide them so now I still have everything selected but the marching ants are hidden so now everything that I draw will still be within those selected selected boundaries. And if you want to bring the marching ants back, you can just hit control H again and they're back again. Now hiding those marching ants is very useful uh, when you're doing digital painting or doing something that um, requires a lot of precision because you won't see those um, almost in the way you'll just see basically what the image 
will look like after you're finishing it after you're finished editing it so it's good to hide those every now and then um, and if you want to get rid of those marching ants you just hit uh, control D and it'll deselect everything um, I hear you have the clone stamp tool and basically the clone stamp will clone um, whichever part of your image you want it to all you have to do is hit alt and you'll see these little um, almost crosshairs pop up and you click on that part of the image and now it will sample everything from the area that you just clicked so since I clicked on that red area then that's the area that it'll be sampling from and it'll basically copy everything from that area and you'll see um, a lot of photo editors use this in particular um, when they're trying to um, paint something out of the background or um, you know paint a cloud out or actually make a person's skin tone look more even and actually let me pull up a photo that we could use for reference this will be an easy one so let's say Um, you want to make uh, this side of her skin tone um, more similar to this side. All you do is hold Alt, click in this space, and now everything you paint will be sampled from this area. So now when I go down to paint, you'll see it's basically cloning the area that I already had selected. So that's one way that um, photo editors use to even out a person's skin tone. Also, um, the way that I'm kind of like going back through my steps is just hitting Control Z and that'll take you back a step. It's uh, undo. Uh, next is the history brush uh, we won't really get into this very much it will save that for a, a more advanced class uh, we have the eraser tool which is pretty self-explanatory um, basically it'll erase you know everything that you draw over there are a uh, few different options for the erase tool you can either use the brush mode in which it'll basically um, use whichever brush you pick to be the format for your eraser so since I'm picking this softer brush then now all of the edges on my eraser tool will be softer whereas if I pick this more uh, jagged brush then all the edges on my tool will be uh, sharper and a bit more jagged. You can also use the, uh, the pencil tool which is basically the exact same uh, brush setups. However, uh, the pencil tool is a bit more pixelated and this is what you'll see people using uh, to draw pixel art basically. Uh, and then you have the block tool which is basically just a square. It's just a square. There's no sort of fading on the edges. It's, you know, exactly what you expect. And you'll see people using this uh, for pixel art as well. But for the most part, I stick to the brush. Uh, next, you have the paint bucket tool. Now, the paint bucket tool it'll basically just allow you to fill you know uh, a large area with a single color quickly so I can just click and it'll fill the entire area that I click on 
with whatever color I have selected. Um, this is really good when used in conjunction with the um, with the marquee tool because you can kind of select out areas that you want to fill with a color and then just quickly go in with the paint tool the paint bucket tool and just fill it in with whatever color you want it. Now one of the alternates for the paint tool is the gradient tool and you can access that just by clicking in the lower right hand corner of your tool here and it'll bring up the uh, other options for it and if you select the gradient tool now you'll see this option opens up on your upper left hand side and if you click on that it'll give you the options for your gradient uh, your gradient can be whatever color you like if you click on this end you'll see this color pop up down here and you can basically select whatever color you like for your gradient so just to be a bit different we'll go with a blue and we'll leave this in blank for now but if you click you'll notice it's not like the paint tool you can't just click and it'll just fill you actually have to click and then drag across the area that you want to be filled and then when you release you'll see it automatically lays in a gradient for you so now if you had this the marching ants hidden then all you'd see is that gradient that you just laid down and again you can make this gradient uh, whatever colors you like so let's say you wanted to put another color at the front of your gradient let's go with I don't know lime green something that'll really stand out so now as you can see this end is a bit more green and this end is a bit more blue so now if you drag that across again you'll notice the colors are a bit different and that's the gradient tool again there's a lot more detail that we can go into with the gradient tool uh, but we'll save that for the advanced class um, next up you have the uh, blur sharpen and smudge tool uh, blur and sharpen do pretty much exactly what you think uh, the blur tool if you click on you know a part of your image it'll make it a bit more blurry and the sharpen tool will do the exact opposite will make it sharper however the tool that I really want to get into is the smudge tool because the smudge tool is again something that um, you'll see used um, a lot for uh, digital artists um, and you will see it used in uh, photo editing as well uh, basically what the smudge tool does it is it allows you to uh, almost finger paint on your image so let's say I had an orangish color here and I wanted to kind of smudge that into the background and I could just take my smudge tool um, switch to a softer brush uh, go back over here let's make this a little bigger and then use that to kind of soften this edge here so you'll see digital artists use the smudge tool a lot for blending because it gives you a, a really nice uh, blended effect um, another cool thing about the smudge tool is you can also use that in conjunction with the uh, marquee tool as well so if you only wanted to uh, smudge a specific area of your image you can use that marquee tool and now when you pick up your smudge tool it'll only smudge what's within those boundaries 
so now you can have this area all smudged like this while leaving the other area pretty much untouched now hide those marching ants so you can kind of see the effect it has yeah so there's a smudge tool uh, next up we have the uh, dodge and burn tool now dodge and burn are basically uh, used to either make your in your image lighter or darker and you'll see people use this a lot uh, for metal for metal textures because the dodge tool gives you a really um, almost burnt out kind of effect which you'll see as I start dodging this lighter area on her forehead it'll really make it seem almost um, almost washed out so you can see it's lightening it in a very specific way so that's what it looks like now that's what it looked like before now the dodge tool uh, sorry the burn tool is the exact opposite it'll just darken things now the burn tool usually darkens things just by making the uh, color more saturated so just know that if you use this on any sort of colors it's just going to make it seem more saturated but in black and white it just makes things darker and again you'll see this used a lot in photo editing um, to darken specific areas but you'll also see it used in digital painting for the exact same reason now to show you the different effect that it has on colors you can see that if I use the dodge tool just just on this red background it's actually just making it a lot more saturated so you can use this to lay in shadows and um, things of that nature uh, next up we just have the uh, text tool which is pretty self-explanatory um, you click on an area and it'll let you type out text um, right now I have mine set to center but if you set it to left format then that'll change the uh, formatting of it and again right format the exact same thing um, you can just type in whatever text you want uh, if you select the text you can go up here to the actual font type and if you wanted to you could just cycle through the fonts by clicking down on your um, keyboard and it'll basically cycle through all of the text that you have loaded into Photoshop or loaded onto your computer so it's a really easy way of cycling through text to figure out which one looks best for your particular project. Now, if you wanted to, um, you know, alter this text and make it bigger, you could either do that just by selecting it and going up here to change the size like so or you could actually wait until after you um, you rasterize the text now rasterizing the text will make it um, uneditable as far as you know being able to just click on it and type more letters or words on it so if I go here and right click on that that layer and go here to rasterize type it'll make it uneditable however if you click control T now 
you can resize it however you see fit. And that's usually a, a step that I save for last just because it does make the text uneditable. So if I just kept it, you know, editable, I could still go up here, click Control T, and still make it whatever size I like, while still keeping the ability to go back in and type in more letters or words or whatever I want to do. Uh, next is the pen tool. Now the pen tool is if you've ever used um, Adobe Illustrator before it's exactly like the pen tool from Adobe Illustrator. So it works based off of vectors rather than um, you know what your the regular brush tool works off of. So instead of drawing like this if you click on the pen tool you'll see it'll connect it'll create a point and if you click somewhere else it'll connect those two points and still holding down the left kick click button if you drag it then it'll give you a curved line and you can use this to make very precise uh, line work And then if you click on that point that you begin with, it'll basically close up your shape. Now right now I have my pen tool set to path, which means it's basically just going to leave this path along the uh, lines that I created. But if you set your pen tool up here to shape, then it'll actually create a closed off shape once you close off that line. And the way that you can tell it's a closed off shape is it will give you these two options up here fill and stroke. Now stroke is basically just going to be the line that you drew so if I make this background invisible here and make this stroke a bit thicker because right now it's set to one pixel so let's set it to like I don't know 10 pixels so now you can see that that stroke actually shows up now you can see the the actual red line that that stroke is making and actually let's make it 20 pixels so you can see it a bit better now the interior is going to be edited by using fill and you can just pick one of these colors or come up with a new color on their own but it's just going to fill that shape with whatever color you choose so now not only do you have the uh, stroke line but you also have the interior which you can fill with a, whatever color you want um, Uh, the next tool is just the path selection tool. You can use this to select whatever path you are just working with. Um, we're not going to really get into this tool very much either. We'll save that for a more um, advanced class because it gets into a lot of um, you know editing specific points on your path, um, and we don't have enough time for that today. So we're just going to move on to the shape tool. Now the shape tool, I right now have mine set to ellipse, but if you click in that lower right hand corner of the tool again, it'll bring up these other options. So you could have a, a rectangle, a rounded rectangle, or an ellipse, a polygon tool, which the polygon tool, you can actually decide how many sides you want your polygon to have. Uh, right now I have mine set to five sides up here. 
and it'll basically give you a five-sided, well, a pentagon. So, as you can see, it's still using those same settings that I had my shake tool uh, set to. Uh, sorry, my pen tool set to. And it'll basically draw shapes using those exact same settings. Um, and again, let's say I want to do an octagon. I'd go up, come up here, set the sides to eight. Then it'll create an octagon instead. Uh, you can set it to three and it'll make a triangle instead. But yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, next, my next tool is the uh, rotate tool and this basically allows you to uh, rotate your canvas so this is very useful um, for digital painting since you can't really you know tilt your whole pad then this will allow you to uh, rotate your canvas around so you can draw at different angles um, and if you ever are unsure if you have your your um, canvas reset to a dead center you can just hold down shift and shift will allow you to uh, rotate uh, so the last things I wanted to touch on were layer modes and layer modes are a very very powerful tool that you can use in Photoshop so one thing that you'll find is that layer modes can be used to color black and white images so if I make a new layer above this photograph and then I go up here where it says normal and click on this window you'll see it'll bring up um, a lot of options um, but we're only going to be focusing on a few of those options for now uh, let me set my image to RGB color now if I set this layer above my black and white image to color now anything that I color on this layer and actually let's rename this layer color now anything that I color on this layer is basically going to transfer its color information onto the actual black and white image. And this is very useful because it's a non destructive method of coloring your images because if I click this little eyeball here it'll basically make all the information on this layer um, invisible and as you can see it left the black and white image intact so now I could go in and let's say I want to make the background a kind of a, a bluish color and I could color that in in the background And it's, it's just a useful useful tool um, now that's just color mode I'm gonna make a new layer on top here and I'm gonna set it to color dodge now color dodge it basically lightens your image if any of you guys are familiar with Ross Tran um, this is what he uses to create a lot of his um, you know really bright lighting effects because it kind of gives you that bright lighting feel so if I set my color to like this oranges color here you'll see that when I actually start coloring on the image it gives you the effect of almost having a light source up there you'll actually see people use this a lot 
another powerful tool is clipping masks. Now clipping masks are going to save your life in Photoshop. All clipping masks do is let's say and actually the easiest way to do it all right I'm gonna select and copy uh, just a part of our head here so I'm gonna copy that by pressing control C for copy and I'm going to go up here and paste special paste in place which will basically assure that I'm pasting that head exactly where I copied it from now if I make another layer on top of her face and then I hold down alt and hover in between those two layers you'll see it makes a little arrow with a square next to it and I'm just gonna left click that which will clip this layer on top <clears throat> to the layer below it you can also do that exact same thing just by going over to this right hand side uh, clicking on those lines and then it'll give you the option to clip your layer to the layer above it right here so create clipping mask is just going to clip this layer to the layer directly beneath it now what this does is it's almost like that selection tool in which it'll only color over whatever is in this bottom layer here so since i only copied and pasted pasted her face then it's only going to color oops sorry wrong layer it's only going to color on the layer that's directly beneath it. So this is another uh, non-destructive method of coloring your images. And again, you can use the, um, the layer options to make that, you know, whatever layer type you want it to be. So if it was just a color layer, then it's just gonna, you know, add color to the layer beneath it. Now, let's say you wanted to fade that color. It was a little too, um, a little too vivid for you. If you go up here and click on this fill icon, then it'll actually allow you to decide how full you want that color to be so you can make it really subtle or you could just keep it really vivid but yeah that's um, pretty much our beginning Photoshop class for today